Okay, I think we'll get started. I'm Betsy Peck Learned, Dean of University Library Services, and I'd like to welcome you all to our second Talking in the Library event this fall. Um, all of our library, um, e all of our Talking in the Library events um, are from the generosity of um, Mary Tuft White, who endowed um, a fund for us to support bringing speakers here to talk about their experiences and their, their writing. Um, we also want to thank the Stemple Foundation for helping us bring our speaker tonight, Johar Ilham, um, to Roger Williams. And um, we're pleased to welcome her back. She actually was here about five years ago to speak about a, a book that she published. And she was interviewed by Professor Adam Braver, who's going to introduce her again. Um, and, another, and a student whose name is Ashley Barton, maybe some of you um, knew Ashley, or probably not if it was five years ago. But. Um, professor Braver is our library program director and a professor of crea creative writing. And he's going to introduce Johar in just a moment. But I just wanted to briefly mention our final Talking in the Library event, which will be November 20th with Robert Boyers, um, a public intellectual and editor of the quarterly journal Salma Gundy, and professor of English at Skidmore College, where he's taught for 50 years. 50 years. It's a long time. <laughs> and he's going to speak about his most recent book, The Tyranny of Virtue, Identity, the Academy, and the Hunt for Political Heresies. Um, and it's currently on our new bookshelf. It just came in a couple days ago. So please check it out. And now I'd like to ask Professor Braver to introduce our speaker. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for coming out. It's great to see so many people in the room. Um, especially on a, on a topic that is um, um, important um, to contemporary times and also um, one which is also complicated and complex, so good to get some understanding of that. Um, in brief, um, Johar, as Betsy indicated, um, has a, a, a little bit of a history here with Roger Williams um, in that in 2015, um, well in 2014, is that what went to the U.S.? No, 2013. 2013, okay. Um, that's right. It all seems like yesterday. <laughs> um, um, in 2013, Johar was um, accompanying her father on a visit to the United States where he was going to be a uh, visiting uh, lecturer fellow at, at Indiana University. Um, Johar was 18 at that time. She just finished her first semester of college. Um, and she was coming here for a couple of weeks with him to help him get um, set up, established um, in, in the U.S., visit the U.S., um, and uh, as they were getting ready to board the plane, he was detained by the police um, and taken into custody. Um, Johar was, um, somebody turned to Johar and said, well, are you, are you still going to the U.S.? Um, which um, turns out may have been something of a mistake on, on that end. Um, and um, our father said, go, go, go. So. At 18 years old, with one semester of college under her belt, and, um, and I met Johar not long after that. Um, pretty good English, but oh, yeah, <laughs> okay <laughs> English. Um, 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 got on a plane with um, the no paperwork or the or the you know the wrong paperwork um, to to get here, and no um, standing in the U.S. and showed up and landed in Chicago on her way to Bloomington, Indiana. Um, and there's all obviously a lot of story um, that, that falls after that, um, but I told you how it connects with Roger Williams. Around that time, um, our student advocacy um, seminar, um, which um, is still continues to this day, and I hope some of you may, uh, some of you in here may consider working on that as well in the future, um, which works with the organization Scholars at Risk, um, advocating on behalf of threatened and imprisoned scholars. Um, we got assigned her father's case. Um, and um, we were told, well, his daughter is here in the US. Um, some students reached out to Johar. And um, within about three or four weeks, we were all meeting in Washington, DC, and taking her around to meet with various US representatives um, to discuss her, her, her father's case. Um, and I will fast forward to say that um, within the last six, so that was about five, or, that was about six years ago. Um, and obviously it was very new to Johar, very nerve-wracking to Johar um, in many respects. Um, but you know, within the last six months, Johar has met with President Trump in the Oval Office. 
Um, she's presented at the General Assembly of the United Nations um, alongside the Secretary of State and the Vice President um, and the President and attended numerous meetings with European officials. So um, a, a, a long um, and sort of swift journey uh, for someone who uh, um, was perhaps called on but was not asking to be called upon. Um, and um, but what has and what she's here to talk about tonight um, is what is going on. Um, so tomorrow, by the way, um, there will be a. This is a talking in the library. There will be a talking beyond the library um, that um, that Dr. Cole is hosting in his classroom in GHH 205, 206, 206 um, where Johar will be a little more informal and, can, and we'll talk more about the story I was just telling and more about her experience. Um, but you know, at this time, while there were issues of, of Uyghurs have uh, issues affecting Uyghur people, including her father, um, it, um, in, the, in these last five or six years, it's turned into something much more expansive, much more massive, and, and much more concerning, at least in the eyes of, um, of, of most of the world, um, and, uh, and yet another new calling um, for, for Johar, um, and to be a, uh, in concern about her people. And so, um, I do want to not, don't want to forget, as I did last time, in the back are copies of the book Johar um, um, worked on, um, and uh, they're for sale from our bookstore for $14.25 with tax included, um, <laughs> checks, credit cards taken, uh, and cash, um, and Johar, I'm sure, would be happy to sign them if, if, um, if you are so inclined. Um, but you did not come to hear me talk, so I will <laughs> hand it over to Johar. Can you guys hear me? Uh, there are a few more chairs here if you want to come to the front and yeah, check them. Um, so, my name is Jahar Ilham. Um, well, even though I've been spending time for, like, for six years here, I still don't speak very good English, so please forgive me if, my, if I make any grammatical mistakes, just ignore it. <laughs> and um, so today we'll be talking about who are the Uyghurs and what happened to them or what is happening to them. Um, you can see there is a, this is like a keyboard thing. You can see it's like Arabic, uh, Arabic letters and this is a Uyghur writing system. Um, among the world, Uyghurs are one of the most ancient Turkic people. Um, Uyghur language is a Turkic language and it most closely resembles Uzbek language. It is also similar to other Turkic languages like Kazakh and Kyrgyz and most of us we all use those uh, Arabic letters for our writing system. Um, Uyghurs have approximately 15 to 20 million uh, population in China. The Uyghur region um, which is also called as Xinjiang in Chinese language. Here are two mass maps of Uyghur, uh, Uyghur region. As you can see, it is considered as a huge area and we all know China is a huge country. Um, um, uh, this is a map that was released by the Chinese government and in, if I translate it to English, it will be Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region and here's a map of Google. Um, it is located at a uh, northwest part of China and it's connected to uh, all the stands over there in Central Asia and connects to Tibet over here and Mongolia over here. Um, the Uyghur region is known for their natural resources like gold, uranium, natural gas and oil. Also, as I just mentioned, uh, uh, Uyghur, uh, Uyghur region is a huge area. It, it makes up to one sixth of the land mass, but only one percent of the total population. For the past decades, the Chinese government has been sending Han Chinese to the Uyghur region in order to solve the overcrowdedness issue. And Han Chinese is the dominant group in China, and the group most people um, would think when they when they think of Chinese people. Yeah. Um, Uyghurs have lived in. Um, Xinjiang region for over 
2,000 years, and over the past 2,000 years, Uyghurs have believed in Tangrism, shamanism, um, Manichaeism, and Buddhism, and today, majority of the Uyghurs are Sunni Muslims. I would say uh, Uyghurs nowadays are as diverse as Americans. Here are the picture of all kinds of Uyghurs. Um, uh, you can see men in dopa, which is a traditional Uyghur hat, or you can see women in hijab. You can see girls in colorful, colorful Uyghur atlas dresses. It's also a traditional pattern. Um, you can also see stylish men with glasses. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. Um, so now, the happy part passed. Here comes the question, which is also the main topic of my presentation today. What is happening to the Uyghurs and what happened to them? You can see a pic uh, two pictures, two photos here. One was taken in 2015, one was taken in 2017. Digital difference. We have those games that you can find the difference. And the <laughs> yeah, so I think it's not too difficult to find the difference, right? You can see the minarets have been taken down from this uh, Islamic traditional architecture. Um, and this is not very rare. It's happening to most of the um, uh, buildings or architectures that have, that have um, Islamic uh, patterns or, or, or pictures on it. And before, after. Uh, here's a uh, Islamic saying of la uh, ilaha illallah, which is no god but uh, means which uh, there's no god but Allah, and it has been switched to a um, Chinese government slogan: "Love Communist Party, love China, love country." This is what it means literally. Yeah, and also the minarets have been taken down and switched to a Chinese flag. It's all, oh, by the way, it's the exact same building. And another, love Communist Party, love, love China. And the doors of a mosque, it's been had blocked in Turpan. Turpan is a city in Xinjiang. And why is it padlocked? Because Muslims are afraid to practice their religion. And which can cause them consequences, consequences uh, of worshipping in public. And Sean Zhang is a person I will be introducing him later on. Uh, he posted uh, this picture and you can see this historic mosque has been taken down in Kashgar. And this is a very interesting example of um, restrictions about uh, Islam in, in Xinjiang region. Um, so before I came here, this was the uh, sign I see the most when I wanted to purchase Uyghur halal or halal not Uyghur halal food, and this is the sign. You can also find similar signs here if you go to Costco. They have the lamb that has signs like this, and so far these two are the only signs that are allowed for saying halal, which is means halal in Chinese language. Um, but other other pictures that has anything like uh, Christian moon and those Islamic symbols, patterns, and Arabic writings are all not allowed. And you can also see this is a store, um, a, a signboard for a store. Um, you can see the halal uh, halal words are wiped out of the signboard. And of course. Uh, checkpoints police are on the streets all the time uh, not like here pe people might run into a police you can see every 20 centimeters or 50 centimeters I don't know how when it can become inches or mile I still <laughs> can't do that <laughs> sorry um, and you can it's like the um, spy movies you know you can find those um, and checkpoints for men, when men and women on the streets. Checkpoints. Oh, those are poli your police brothers are waiting for you on the streets to wait for you to hand over your phones so they can um, uh, install 
tracking applications into your phone. Checkpoints, checkpoints, checkpoints. And those are, uh, when I mentioned about the applications in your phone, it can, it can tell the policeman your usage for your electricity, the website you've been uh, searching, um, your name, your information, your age, everything. And QR code. Just like going to a Zara store and looking for a size you want, a policeman can go into uh, in front of your door and scan the QR code in front of your door and to get all the personal information of you. A state press photo showing Chinese officials sharing sleeping quarters with Turkic Muslim families during compulsory homestay becoming family program in Xinjiang. Um, just two days ago, uh, there were reports of Chinese government has been sending men to sleep in the same beds as Uyghur Muslim women while their husbands are in concentration camps. And please uh, look at this picture. Here's that game again. Find the difference. Just I'm going to show you the next picture. Um, maybe because of the color, you will be uh, mostly paying attention to those flags. But the most important thing is, oops, went too far. Sorry. Um, yep. Um, cameras, cameras. Um, there has been lots of reports about their surveillance system uh, that targets the Muslim community in China. And reports, reports. Do any of you uh, recognize these brands? Dahua and uh, Hikvision are two major uh, video surveillance companies in China. And the Hikvision, this one right here, uh, is the world's largest video uh, surveillance geomark maker. You can find them on Amazon, uh, sometimes even Walmart. Um, and it was proven true that it was the main provider for the Chinese government to target the moni uh, and, and monitor the Muslim community in Uyghur region. Yeah, here's a, you see the prime here. Yeah. Creation. Yeah, this is the person that I said I will I will be introducing to you. He was the person. Uh, he was the first person who exposed the picture or the exact location of the first few camps. Shan Zhang can read a little tweet of him here. And with this, uh, with this, if you. Uh, type in from Google ABC Net Australia News on November 1st, you will see a very uh, detailed report of when they first revealed the locations and satellite photos of the concentration camps. Here's the grand opening of a new campus, uh, camps. You see the red ribbons to celebrate the opening of a camp and also another picture of um, re-education camp, concentration camp. In early 2017, there were rumors going around about the existence of the re-education camps. In fact, back then, lots of people, um, Uyghur people, didn't um, even know the term concentration camp or re-education camp. Um, the Uyghurs know there were masses of Uyghurs were disappearing, um, but they didn't know where they'd been taken to. They don't know where, why they disappeared. Lots of Uyghurs didn't know that terms like concentration camp and re-education camp even existed. Or I also can say um, many people couldn't accept the fact that in modern days, things like this could still be a thing and still could exist. And until 2018, Sean Jung was the first person who actually finally found out the evidence mm -hmm. of proving the concentration camp or the re-education camp, according to a Chinese language, that actually exist. And this is the location. You can see the, this empty landscape. In 2014, it was empty, and 2018, a huge area was built. And empty in 2016, full of buildings. Uh, One to three million Uyghurs have been sent to large modern-day concentration camps. 
It is also called as re-education camp, as I said, uh, in a Chinese government government's language. The camps are the culmination of decades of repressive and policies of assimilations by the Chinese government, as they aim to socially re-engineer the Uyghur people. Everything that makes the Uyghur people unique has been treated as abnormality and mental disease. And here's a form that I would like to show you. It says population data collection form. It is also a form can show you, which can show you a possible reason could send you to a concentration camp. Religious faith, Uyghur or unemployed, passport holder, praise daily, religious training, visited one of 26 countries. Do you have contacts abroad? Be careful if you have contacts in overseas, you kind of go into jail. And social uh, stability situation, persons of interest or members of special population, relatives in detention, um, safe average and safe, um, all these could be possible reasons for you to be sent to a concentration camp or re-education camp. <sighs> Scholars and univers universities. This is a number that um, UHRP Uyghur Human Rights Project have collected. Um, there were 338 um, people reported they have family members who are, who are from those categories were disappearing or sent or confirmed that they were sent to the camps. And this data was collected in January 2019, and the number goes up in March. And it goes higher in 2019. So not everyone has a overseas contacts. And so far, there were 435 people reported about they having family members are sent to a concentration camp. And those people are only the ones who were able to testify outside of China. And what about those who don't even have a family members in overseas? Or their family members are too scared to testify? What about those people? This is a picture of so far um, what we have uh, proven that those people have been sent to camps, and this is this picture right here is my father. He has been sent to a prison, not a camp, but he's he was very one of the very first person who was arrested for a wrong reason. Um, see, this is also um, family members in overseas holding up. Uh, their family members or friends uh, who have been disappeared by Chinese government or who has been sent to a concentration camp by Chinese government, their pictures. So those people in the last picture were mainly scholars, intellectuals, and China claims that these sprawling camps with barbed wire and armed guard towers are vocational training centers. Detainees include medical doctors, academics, uh, businessmen, singers, soccer players, comedian, as well as young children and the elder people. None of them, uh, none of them, they need a job training. And many people have asked me, what can they do to help? Well, I have been asked for this question for so many, uh, so many times. And since I'm at a u university today, and some of you might be scholars, some of you might be students, and there's a lot of things you can do. Here's a link. If you're a scholar, you can uh, go to this link and sign a statement. There are tons of forms you can sign. There's tons of petitions you can sign. There's tons of statements you can go sign. and with every country, a scholars is a scholar. The community of scholars is a main community that every government or every every country um, values a lot. So if if you shows your concern, the government could also 
shows their concern could maybe trigger them to speak up for the Uyghur cause. And until 2019, this May, there were seven, more than 700 signatures uh, from, from uh, 700 scholars from 42 countries have signed uh, the statement and you can do that too. You can also visit the site uh, website uh, you, if you just type in UHRP in Google. I don't work with them, but I think they are they have been doing a great job on uh, showing people the specific steps on what they can do to help or where to gather those information. And UHRP, Uyghur Human Rights Project. You see uh, this side of the website can show, you just click into it, they have a, a list of things you can do. Um, um, before this, oh yeah, very first one, and it's the most important one I would say, House Resolution HR 649. It's a, um, it's a bill that Uyghur people are trying to pass in the U.S. Um, it has just recently passed the Senate, but we're try still trying to push it and to pass the, con uh, pass the House. It'd be great if, no matter if you can sign the sign the statement that I just showed you uh, in the previous slide, but you can, you can, as long as you have a phone, you can call your local governors, can call your representatives, your congressmen, and to make them push this bill. This bill means a lot for the Uyghurs, and this. You can share the UHRP's report. You can write to the International Federation of Red Cross. You can write to the International Olympic Committee, which they're holding, uh, China is holding the, oops, sorry, 2020's uh, Winter Olympics. And uh, you can write to the companies with operations in Xinjiang, like Dahua Hikvision, and there are tons of other companies um, have been doing, uh, have been cooperating with the Chinese government, uh, with, uh, with, with, uh, uh, financially wise and you can help to avoid that I'm pretty sure the businessmen can find other way to earn their money not by supporting a concentration camp uh -huh. yeah. the I would like to say that um, this is my first <laughs> presentation about the concentration camp uh, for the past five years I've only been adv advocating for my father's uh, freedom in order to get him free. Um, I am not a, an expert on Xinjiang. I did not even grow up in Xinjiang. I was born and raised in Beijing. I didn't speak Uyghur very well until I came to US. I took classes at Indiana University in order to learn my own culture and my, um, my own language. Um, I didn't think I was ready to speak up for for my people or for the Uyghurs. Um, I still don't think I'm ready. Uh, I still don't think I know enough. But too bad. Most of the people who know better than me are sent to camps now. Um, and I cannot give up opportunities like this. Opportunity, opportunities to speak freely, to stand on a st stage like this, to speak up for my people, because many, many others, they can't have an opportunity like this anymore. They can't even, they don't have, they don't even have to speak about a concentration camp. They can't even talk about, they can't even meet their families anymore. They don't even have chance to speak about what they want to have for dinner anymore. And I can't give up a, a chance like this to talk about my people. This is not only about Uyghurs. Uh, if I was not an Uyghur, I would do so because this is not about one community. This is a human humanitarian issue. And this is one of the largest humanitarian crises after the World War II. History repeats itself and we do not want to see the same thing happen again. Everything looks so familiar, right? I wanted to um, post uh, put some comparison pictures but I think it's too crucial I didn't want to do that to you to your normal Wednesday night so I wanted to make it more peaceful look more peaceful um, but if you are willing to learn more 
uh, or torture yourself, you can go on Google and or at the Q and A question uh, question part, uh, you can ask me, and I'm happy. I'm op open to any questions. Thank you. Anyone has a question? Yeah. Yes. So, please. how badly mistreated are they? Are they being abused? Yes. Um, yes. There has been. I also wanted to put that in, but the image is too bad, so I didn't want to. There has been reports. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, oh, by the way, I've been working on a doc documentary film. That's how I uh, got a chance to um, interview a lot of camp survivors. Um, few of my camp survivors were ma managed to able to skip to the U.S. And in her test testimony, she stated that. There has been raping going on. Um, Thirty people share one prison room. It's not I promise me. It's not uh, half. The the prison room is not half size of this room, so it's very small room. Um, people will have to ten people sleep on the on the floor. The rest of the twenty would stand against the wall, and they would take turns. Every two hours, they would change term to in order to go to, go to sleep and deny for food um, sitting on electronic chairs um, feeding unknown medications uh, for God know, God know what reasons it's for um, we don't know if it's for experiment or for other um, she said she got fed for medicines and she started uh, vomiting white foams and she started having illusions and they would uh, torture her psychologically and phys physically. Um, when they're trying to question her, in, in the beginning they would feed her medicine and then started telling her, we killed your dad, we killed your mom, we just killed your children, and you have no one left. All you can do is just to tell us the truth because there's no one left in the world that cares about you. And stuff like this in order to brainwash her. but. She didn't do anything, so there was nothing coming out of her mouth, and she got tortured more for not saying other useful information. Um, also, very recently, um, unfortunately, I don't have a um, a proof proof for what I'm going to tell you. Um, also, there has been a report of organ harvesting. Um, that I have a picture of, which is a fast lane in the airport for transporting um, organs. So there's a fast lane that says organs only. So that shows how common it is because you have organs going in this airport lane every day so they have a specific lane for that. Um, yes, that's... that's Is your father in, having living in conditions <coughs> like this? Um, to be honest, I haven't heard about my father since 2017. According to the Chinese law, the family members should be allowed to visit the political prisoner every month, but my father was only allowed to be visited every three months in the beginning. And then, but everything stopped in 2017. I think it's directly related to the concentration camp. Um, my family members are not allowed to visit him anymore and we don't know if he's still held in the same prison room uh, or the same prison and we don't know if he's safe he's healthy or if, he, if he's even alive but before 2017 uh, when my stepmother was able to visit him he lost 40 pounds he was denied food twice uh, each time 10 days um, he was shackled, beaten. Um, his hair, he's almost half bald now. And, the, and the, the only hair he has left are all white. Uh, and he's only, he just turned 50 years old two weeks ago. So it's not time, it's not. So it means he has been through a lot, but we don't know what he has been through inside. Any other questions? Yes. Was there one single event that started this 
persecution? Um, or or did, was it just the number of Han moving into <coughs> the Uyghur region? The, the oppression has started back in decades ago, um, but people only noticing, or the things gone very, very bad in late 2016, and people started realizing, oh, there's something going on, and it's very bad only in early 2017. Yes. Have you went, um, have you went back to your country since you moved here? Uh, unfortunately, I'm too scared. Yeah. I don't think I, if I ever go back there, I will be able to... Um, I, I don't think I will be able to s go anywhere outside of a prison. So, yes, I haven't been able to go back. Yes. Yes, please. I know that there's prejudice against Muslims throughout the entire world, but do you think there's a reason why not as many people are talking about this? Um, it took me and other Uyghur community here a very hard time to gain aw awareness for us. First of all, um, Uyghurs have been li living in, um, so first of all, China is a country that doesn't allow Twitter, Facebook, and uh, social media uh, platforms like this. So it's very difficult to let the news out. That's the first, first case. And second of all, once they try to contact people here, they can be sent to a pr prison or a concentration camp, and people are scared in there. So getting first-hand information is, has been very difficult. That was the first case. Second, Islamophobia that has been going on all over the world. Um, people are scared to talk about or support Muslims when they hear Muslim. Um, but uh, I am glad that nowadays uh, we have, um, well, we have made a s huge progress. Well, we can't say that every single person knows about Uyghur, but um, most of the people uh, who, who read news or, or who go to school, they, they ca somehow has an idea of, if they don't know Uyghur, they know there's a Muslim population in China has been uh, under suppression by the Chinese government. And I'm still looking uh, forward to um, push more uh, push the case more. Uh, gaining awareness, awareness is not the only um, uh, um, goal for me. Um, fixing the issue is the main goal for me. Uh, now I'm looking forward to, um, I've been cooperating with the US government and the European Parliament in order to take actions uh, on um, helping those Uyghurs um, you know, to, to release by the Chinese government. Do the Han Chinese repopulating Xinjiang province, are they aware of the Chinese government's policy towards Uyghurs? Um, that I'm not sure, but I do know the Han Chinese here, most of them don't know. Um, so one of the reason is um, it's a habit that Han Chinese students don't really use Western media outlets. Um, most of my friends, They've been here for many, many years, Chinese friends, Han Chinese friends. They do not use Google. They still use Baidu. That's a searching engine in China. It's a Chinese version of Google. And of course, when you search stuff in Baidu, you do not get the information you want. You only get the information what the Chinese government wants you to see. Everything is censored and it's selected. Um, so I remember when this issue first happened, or not first time, it's been, uh, I think it was last year, it's been a while. Uh, I told my very close friend about this, and she goes to dental school, so she's pretty smart. Um, and she looked at me and said, Johar, I feel so bad for you. And I was like, oh, she's like, you're so brainwashed by the Western media. Uh, oh, I am so brainwashed. <laughs> Interesting, yes. Um, so she said, I checked all over Weibo, Weibo, which is a Chinese version of Facebook. There's no concentration camp. It's a lie. 
so after I showed her all the images, videos, uh, if you check YouTube, you can also find a train station mm -hmm. video. If you just check, check train, sta train station Uyghur, you will find the video that I'm talking about, um, that which can be proved that concentration <coughs> camp also exists. And the satellite pictures, you can also, we can also prove that they exist. Uh, now she believes it, but she rejects to, uh, she doesn't want to talk about it. Um, deep in her heart, deep in her heart, she knows it's wrong, but she also think rejects that Chinese government, her beloved country's leader, would do such a thing to any group of people, no matter inside China or outside China. They should have. She she uh, she knows that this is not supposed to be happening, but she is too sad or cared too much to to admit that this is happening. Yeah, and I'm sure a lot of people are like that too. But that's just one single example that I have. Yes. Uh, I don't actually have a question but before I leave. I just wanted to say that you're extremely brave and inspiring. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. What do you think the solution that you are trying to work for is for you? What's the best case scenario? Um. I know, uh, well, this sounds kind of not very optimistic, but I know in the short term, there's no way for the Uyghurs, all the Uyghurs to be released from the concentration camp. But I think it will be more practical to start from small steps. First, gaining awareness to make Chinese government realize people around the world cares, care. That's uh, my first step. Second step letting uh, to l let, let the US government or any other governments to push China to release those names. Many, many others who don't even have family members overseas. Many, many people, they, they've never been out of their village or their town their entire life who has been sent to a camp. And nobody knows that, oh, this person is in a camp. We urge the Chinese government to release the names at least their family members inside China or outside China can know where their uh, family members or friends or uh, uh, no matter what relationship is, um, that where they are and how they're doing. And then slowly, slowly, slowly build up. And everything, it's, it's a, it depends on the time. And, and I know this is a long fight, but I'm ready for it. So let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what has the UN been doing to help you combat this issue? Uh, just this September uh, at the UNGA event, um, uh, they hosted this whole event about uh, Uyghur um, concentration camp. Um, president was there and vice president and also the UN general was there. And I was lucky enough to, invi to be invited to that event and speak about, about it. I think that would be the first uh, let's say um, concrete step for the UN um, to show support because admitting the existence of camp is the most important. Um, many, many, most of the other countries have not been able to do so. Admitting it means they know this is wrong. So, and I would hope U UN can do more. I'm looking forward to it, but. What do you think are the objectives of the Chinese government? And I would doubt you say it got worse in 2016, 2017. Mm -hmm. That's when Xi Jinping was meeting again to consolidate his power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this must be something directly associated with him. But why is he doing this, do you think? And is there, is there an end point for them that they're trying to achieve something? First of all, as I mentioned, I'm not an expert on <laughs> Xinjiang. And, but also I mentioned uh, in the very beginning of my presentation, um, Uyghur region is a region that's full of resources. Gold, oil, every country is right for it, right? And our region is full of that natural resources and that's something I would say any government leaders would be uh, like really, really want, want thirst for. Um, that could be part of the reason and also there's one thing in Chinese, it's called which means if you're not one of our kind, your heart is also not one of our kind. You're always thinking of some other way. Mm -hmm. And also lack of understanding, I would say. Uh, when you don't understand 
each other, you always think the other side is the, the other person is the evil other's side. Um, and I'm sh uh, possible re uh, some according to some scholars, there is also possibility of Belt and Road uh, the Belt and Road. Uh, what is it called? What is it called again? Be Baton Road Initiative? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yes, yes, I think that's the word. I told you my English is not <laughs> quite <laughs> good enough yet, so yes, uh, that could be part of the reason because it's located in, you know, the Silk Road area. It's connected to all the Central Asian uh, countries and the oil transporting goods, uh, oil could all be part of the Reason, yeah. is, is there, and I'm sorry, but is there like an end point? I mean, are they going to keep these people or your people in these camps for forever? Are there, yeah. they're hoping to like... Well, so far, Chinese government has been doing a great job of using our people as a la laborers, um, uh, like uh, creating... Uh, in the past, China has been famous for cheap laborers. And now they got free labor, so we can support Uyghurs can support the cost of the concentration camps now. So if they really want to do it long term, they can possibly do it. That's why we can't just leave it there and let them go fix themselves. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. yes. Have you been able to communicate with family members uh, at home or not? Uh, yes. I cannot contact my stepmother and my two little brothers directly because obviously the technology is now so developed they can directly cut off our phone lines. When I call them, it's empty number, but when I use other people's uh, phones, it, it, it can go through. And all my Chinese social media accounts have been hacked. <laughs> and I stopped <laughs> creating new ones. I've already created 10 of them. Mm -hmm. I am tired of it. So I try to communicate with other friends and let them try to talk to them and we send each other gifts and pictures. And they live in Beijing, so so far they're safe. But in the beginning, when my father first got arrested for eight months, there were six to eight policemen uh, sleeps in front of our door every single day to monitor my two little brothers. When they were, the older one was seven years old, the youngest one was, was um, four years old and they were escorted to school every single day just like bodyguards and then the older one unfortunately he he was at the age of already understanding stuff so he saw my father got taken away in front of his eye um, um, so he already had a sense of what was going on and he was accompanied by all the policemen to school and escorting back every single day um, to grocery shopping to and he, he was not able to play with the <coughs> neighborhood kids anymore and s it affected him s somehow psychologically he, and also physically had he started having some heart issues when he was at seven when he was seven years old now he's feeling so much better but um, I realized that the sa uh, the best way for them to stay safe is to keep them out of this um, after uh, cooperating with some trans uh, US government officials finally um, the Chinese government have uh, let all those six to eight policemen leave our apartment finally so they were able to go to school or go to any other places by themselves well, we might still have some there still might be some people monitoring them every day but secretly at least not not like uh, they they won't be s they're at least visible <laughs> uh, not visible um, and I try not to contact them very often because I am in the category of sensitive people now uh, by the Chinese government and letting them contacting sensitive a member of sensitive people it's not very good for uh, them especially I want to let them have the best life that they can get. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If they were to come over here or try to, would they be arrested at the airport? I don't think it's possible because they don't have a passport. Um, their, their birth 
birth certificates were confiscated. So even if they want to travel to another city, they will need to report to the police station first, and the police station will need to buy uh, like watch them, buy tickets, and 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 escort them stuff like that. Yeah. So there's no way for them. I would wish <laughs> them to be here. I'd be very very happy and very relieved. But it's a very small. There's a very small chance for that. So Har, can you talk about? being Uyghur in Beijing, because I know you're talking about Xinjiang, but you know, one are Uyghur people in Beijing under the same kind of threat, or is it more about people in the region? Um, and also I know you had some experiences with, uh -huh. partly because people didn't assume that you spoke yes. um, um, Chinese. Being in, uh, being in Uyghur in Beijing and in Xinjiang, I, I, I think it's kind of di pretty different. Um, I didn't speak Uyghur very well, but I looked not very Han Chinese. So when and there there are not many foreigners in China. So if you ever visited in visited China, you might experience someone asking you to take a photo together because you look different. Um, yeah, I see people nodding. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I've experienced experienced that. Even though I lived there for eighteen years, I got that all the time uh, because I looked kind of different. Mm. Um, I would go in on the bus and people would start talking about me in Chinese, assume that I don't speak Chinese. And once they figure out that I speak Chinese, then they're like, oh, Xinjiang. -ren. So, oh, people from Xinjiang, like with a very, not very polite face. <laughs> um, and, but, but I would say, in, uh, well, also, when I was in my classroom, if anybody's stuff gets stolen, they would assume that I was the one who stole it, even though I had the most pocket money than anyone in my class. <laughs> so I was very upset about it many times. And they always find out that it was somebody else where they just lost it by um, somewhere in, uh, the, by themselves somewhere else. But I've never received any apologies uh, because of their treatment um, or reaction. Um, I kind of got used to it. I didn't even think it was a thing anymore until we, when we were work, working on, a on the book together, we were talking about it. I was like, yes, I'm pretty mad about that. Mm -hmm. yeah, I thought that was an issue. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's not very healthy that you can think things like this to be a normal, let's say, uh, considered as a normality. Um, it should be abnormal, but it happens so often that we thought, oh, yeah, this is how things is. This is how it is. Yeah. And are people in Beijing that you're aware of, anyway, for the people you've maybe talked to, who are your people currently worried that they're going to be um, taken? So I, I didn't talk to any of the Uyghurs in Beijing, how mm -hmm. they block blacklisted <laughs> everyone blacklisted me so but I do know that um, when my father first got arrested or still well recent recent some of them in order to show um, their respect or loyalty to the Chinese government in order to grant themselves safety or their families well which I completely understand everyone would think consider their families at the first place um, some of them spit uh, my stepmother's face, like, like, like literally spit, said, oh, because of your family, we are under, like, um, we're living in fear. Um, and children, uh, their parents would tell children not to play with my brothers. And my, my, um, their my, my stepmother's co-workers or my mom's co-workers would isolate my both of them in order to show that they are they have no uh, relationship with sensitive people like me and my family um, and I would I was I don't I don't consider that uh, not like as some action that is not respectful. It is not respectful, but I I completely understand. Everyone is living in fear there. Uh, any reaction, any behavior, I completely understand now. Um, I I don't know if I can do better than them if I if I was in their place. Uh, I am only able to speak up about my people and trying to pretend like, oh, I'm so brave here because I'm safe. I have my freedom here. But I might not be able to do any of what I'm doing now if I was in China. Well, 
well, even I try, I wouldn't be able to, though. So, mm -hmm. yes. Do you ever get like any looks or? Would you say like mistreatment from like people, like Chinese people who live here? Who I'm not know? here actually. Um, most of them ignore me because they think I'm just one American person. They don't think I'm Uyghur because we, we I'm sometimes people think I'm Mexican or some Hispanic. <laughs> um, yeah, they don't, they don't really, they wouldn't think that I'm Uyghur or something. But when I speak Chinese, they're like, oh, your Chinese is really good. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I think so too. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, most of the, uh, well, most of, I, I grew up with Chinese people. I don't hate Han Chinese. Um, before coming to here, before coming to US, uh, to the US, I could count with my 10 fingers of how many Uyghurs I know <laughs> personally. So I don't, it's not the problem of Han Chinese group. It's a problem of the government. And also Adam was telling me that when, in one of the lecture he went to, um, there was a pr uh, there was a scholar pr made a presentation about Uyghurs and he said um, China doesn't have an Uyghur issue Uyghurs have a China issue so it's not about the Chinese people it's about the government and <coughs> once the government's policy changed uh, I'm being optimistic I think everything will be fine <laughs> Yeah. But you did run into some problems with, say, parents of s fellow students, Chinese students, exchange students. You here, if you got along with fine, but their families were. Oh yeah, the too. you mean my roommate who wanted to move out? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Oh, oh, wow. oh yeah, so I had a very close friend, oh, I don't feel good to <laughs> say, I feel like I'm betraying her, <laughs> but yeah, so um, I had a very close friend, we're still very good friends now. Um, so I also completely understand her decision. Um, we lived together for a while. She uh, she's also from uh, China. Um, after my father got arrested, she al always knew that there was something going on with uh, with my family and the Chinese government. But she she pretended like not. She didn't want to talk about it. She we always avoid this. But after my father got arrested, she got really scared and she decided to move out. She said, please understand, uh, I have to think about my parents and my family members. They still live in China. I'm afraid they will be in trouble. So if from her, uh, what she says, you can also realize she also knows there's something going on in China. That is not right. Because hanging out with someone's daughter or a prisoner's daughter, you should not be afraid of getting punished in a normal country. So she also knows that there is something going on, not right <laughs> in China, but I don't think she realizes it. Um, it's in her uh, conscience, conscience or instincts, but she maybe she doesn't want to admit it. And she thinks China is a great country, which I respect her. It is a great country, just not very great government. Um, it would be definitely better if no matter if the Communist Party or other party, as long as they change their treatments to treatments to people, then then we better than ever. Yes. Yeah. Any questions? Anything you'd like me to talk about? Yes. Just one more thing. How do you think that we can like inform? the Chinese people because I know you said that everything's like mm -hmm. censored mm -hmm. and it's really hard to like we're overseas mm -hmm. so it's very hard yes. for us to like yes go and like um, advocate and stuff like thank that. Thank you so much for bringing that up. I wanted to talk about it too. Um, it is uh, so another thing that I've been trying to work on is to get Chinese citizens to gain awareness of what is actually going on inside China. Before coming to the US I didn't know about the June 4th Tiananmen Square incident even though I was from Beijing and I did not know what what happened in Beijing I didn't know about the 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 what is it how do I translate it the great big great leap leaf great leap forward is it yeah. great leap forward I I knew about this happened but I didn't know about the details I only learned about it after coming to the US so that shows how much um 
um, the classroom's lack of free, uh, academic freedoms in China. So it is very important that uh, students here, once, one, when, since they have the academic freedom or they have all these access to uh, free uh, media outlets, it's very important to let them gain awareness. Um, every revolution, every changes in a country, it's made by the people inside, inside that country, no matter where it is. Well, it could be because of other country, but the best way I would say it's from their own people. So uh, I, I would, uh, it would be great if um, I can get help from you, if you can tell all your friends, including Chinese friends, to know um, what is going on. I'm sure they're gonna be like, no, you're being disrespectful. Um, maybe start from like a softer tone, not like I know better than you tone. Um, <coughs> Uh, just show them, uh, you know, China is a great country. Uh, this is uh, what I know, and then this is what is the going. Uh, wh wh what's your thought about it? Not like, oh, this is bad. This is bad because everyone and they care. They have too much pride, you know. They don't want to be point out on their face. So you start from a softer way, and then um, approach more times, and then show some proofs. People like to see visual stuff. Um, they believe what they can see. So I think that would be a great way to start. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Oh yeah, try to let your friends get rid of Weibo, um, Baidu, all these. Uh, <laughs> they don't need that here. <laughs> so, yeah. okay, well, thank you, Johar. I want to... I'll <laughs> And again, I'll remind you at 5 o'clock tomorrow in GHH 206, um, Johar will also be there again more informally, uh, really to talk more about her, you know, a little more about her father and, and the experience she had and how mm -hmm. more about how she became an advocate, I think, um, um, and sort of grew into this, th this role of which was not the same person six years ago. Um, <laughs> or a different yeah. version of the first. Yeah, yeah. upgraded one. Upgraded. <laughs> um, so again, thank you, Johar. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. And